Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the sound of singing. To those who are in our local communities of Northern Virginia, the Washington DC metropolitan area, as well as those who join us from afar, welcome to the online worship of United Christian Parish. We are delighted for you to experience this worship service that celebrates the grace of God among God's people through an ecumenical movement and an inclusive ministry of four Protestant traditions, which are the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, the Presbyterian Church USA, the United Church of Christ, and the United Methodist Church. Today during our worship, there is a minute for justice and peace to inspire your participation in work of racial justice and equity. Further information will be included at the end of today's service. These are an effort to both publicize as well as invite you to join our fellowship at 7 p.m. on Friday, the 17th of July for the second part, part two, of our three-part series that is hosted by the Justice and Peace Ministry team of United Christian Parish. Part two focuses upon what racism doesn't want you and I to see. Dr. Lundy Taylor will be our facilitator for the evening and your presence with us is welcome. Please join us for the call to worship. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a land of suffering? We shall sing of courage and the strength of the Lord. How shall we sing the Lord's song when we feel so lonely? We shall sing of unity and faithfulness, of reconciliation and hope. Come, let us sing the Lord's song this day. Let us praise God in all our ways forever. Amen. Amen. Now we enter into a time of confession. 
We come to worship today with our shoulders drooping under the load of our fears and anxieties. Things are not right in our community, and we must acknowledge our own participation in the sin that abounds within it. Let us pray, confessing our sins, concluding with a time of silence. And now our prayer of confession. Comforting God, during this time when so many are hurting, we come seeking your forgiveness, your healing and wholeness. We confess that we have not always been as faithful to you as we promised. This week, when we are tempted to dwell only on our own loneliness, help us reach out to others, being the community we long to have. Thank you for showing us new ways to be the church, the church alive, vibrant, and witnessing to the risen Christ in times like these. Forgive us, O oh God, and help us to faithfully sing God's songs in this strange new world. And now let us pray silently. Amen. Now our assurance of pardon. Indeed, times are tough and life seems so very unfamiliar. Even so, we give thanks that our God is changeless, generous and gracious and always present, even in this strange and challenging new world that God has gifted to us. And so we can trustingly sing God's songs in this strange new world. Alleluia, amen. Welcome to our children's time today. Um, it might look like I'm in the dark, but really I'm in space because our children this week have been doing a virtual adventure to Mars and beyond, learning about what God can do, so much more than we hope for or imagine. And all of that can be done with the power of God in us. So let us see now and watch a video of some of the things our children did and learned this week.
loves you more than you ever will know. God loves your heart and will never let go. Faith is the first step, we're never alone. We're part of God's army, Mars and beyond. Psalm 137 is a lament. The ancient Hebrews were mourning because they were being held captive in a foreign land. This is a lament that's not unique to ancient times, as Bob Marley's adaptation of the psalm attests. Psalms were originally sung, and Bob Marley sure sang it but today I am just going to read it. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there, we hung up our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors as for mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. But how could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth, if I do not remember you. If I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites the day of Jerusalem's fall. How they said, tear it down, tear it down, down to its foundations. O daughter Babylon, you devastator, happy shall they be who pay you back what you have done to us. Happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against the rock. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thank you, Total Praise, for that powerful portrayal of this song, On the Willows. It is from Godspell, which if you haven't seen, you should. The scene takes place in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus singing to the disciples just before he asks them to stay awake as he goes off alone to pray. Beautiful and haunting words for Jesus and for the disciples, just as it was for the Israelites in Babylon, this is a song of lament of deep sorrow and loss. But in God's spell, the song's lyrics stop short of the last verses of the psalm. Happy will be the one who does to you what you did to us, O Babylon. Blessed will be the one who dashes your little ones, your babies, against the rock. What an awful image. One commentator put it this way, Psalm 137 is not for the faint of heart. Leah Shad in her sermon on this passage says, it's hard to believe a psalm like this is even in the Bible. This is a far cry from Jesus' words of forgiving your enemies and those who persecute you. This is raw, uncensored hatred and desire for revenge. Most people don't even realize this psalm is in the Bible. In fact, a previous version of the Lutheran hymnal censored out this psalm altogether from its collection. We don't want to sing about killing babies. We don't even want to think about killing babies. So why is this psalm in the Bible? What are we to do with a psalm like this? Sit down and weep. There we sat down, yeah, we wept. The immense rivers of Babylon said to the exiled one, you're not home anymore. As they remembered Zion, they wept. They wept over the death of so many loved ones. They wept over the loss of almost everything they owned. They wept over the destroyed city of Jerusalem and her, her great temple. And they wept over the agony of a forced march from Judea to Babylon. They wept. They wept over the loss of such a pleasant and blessed past. And they wept. They wept over the forced captivity of their present. And they wept over the bleak nature of their future. Most of us have never lost that much been abused that much, or hoped that much, says Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann. It is difficult for us to pray this psalm because we simply cannot identify, it with, identify with it, thank goodness. So what are we to do with it then? What are we to do with it? Leah Shad says, here is what we must do. We must listen to the voices of Psalm 137. We must hear the agony and even the expression of the desire for sinful violence. And we must listen to Psalm 137 precisely because it is said in the context of prayer. These expressions when heard in prayer serve to illuminate our own feelings and even to accuse us of our own acts of vengeance. That is what I love about the Psalms. 
unlike most of the Bible, it is not God talking to us or even saints talking to us. It is people, people like us, ordinary sinful people like us talking to God, telling God how we feel, explaining to God what we want God to do, whether or not that's the right thing or not. It is what we are feeling at the moment. And when those feelings are far from beautiful, isn't that just the moment when it would be wise to invite God into those feelings? That's just what the psalmist does here. You see, we have to understand the specific historical event that this psalm makes reference to. This psalm reveals the suffering and sentiments of people who experienced firsthand the terrible days, the conquest and destruction of Jerusalem in 587 BC. This was their September 11, their coronavirus. Their temple was destroyed, the very center of their faith. They were uprooted and alienated and everything familiar was gone. Talk about a new normal. And like the Africans who were brought to this country against their will, the Hebrews were forced into the Babylonian captivity. They were taken far from Jerusalem and subjugated as slaves of the Babylonians. Even worse, they watched their conquerors kill their children. Adults might be spared to serve various purposes for the conquerors, but the infants no, the infants were killed to end the community's future, not unlike the Nazis' atrocities against Jewish babies. Psalm 137 is set in the context of what Leah Shade thinks is fair to say the most traumatic event that the Old Testament people ever experienced. The exile to Babylon simply sucked the air out of the life of these people of these people of God when it happened. They were utterly unprepared for it. True, they'd been warned by God's prophet for a century that judgment for their sin was coming, but when it came and how it came simply took their breath away. And you feel that in this song. This is a Hebrew lamenting the exile that the people of God now experience, apart from the temple, apart from Zion, the city of David, the capital of worship of God in this world, the place wherein God manifested God's own special presence and nearness to the people, to the chosen people. And here they are now, captives in Babylon, homesick, despondent, grief-stricken, and a kind of shock sitting by one of the rivers of this hated land, their captors come along taunting them, ordering them to sing happy songs about Zion. Are they cruel or just ignorant? Of course they cannot sing happy songs about Zion in this foreign land. So they hung up their instruments in protest. They hung them in the trees. This kind of thing actually happened in the Nazi death camps, where Jews were forced to sing and dance their music and songs while the soldiers mocked them and laughed at them. It was part of the humiliation intending to rob Jews of their identity, their dignity, and their hope. And so, like the message of the Holocaust, never forget, we are to remember so that it will never happen again. The psalmist then makes a personal vow not to forget Jerusalem, to never forget the temple that has been leveled, the city that has been burned, the king and the leaders and the musicians and the teachers who have been led away to captivity in Babylon. And then with a fury that nearly explodes from the page in chilling lines, every syllable of which jar our very bones and disturbs our hearts, a curse is called down upon the oppressors of God's people, and we recoil in stunned horror. We erase it from our hymnals, from our songs, 
from our musicals, not just because of the curse itself, but because of the reminder of the intense suffering that led to the curse being made in the first place. We don't want to be reminded. In fact, we want to keep that kind of suffering far away. We don't want to hear about the history of slavery and Jim Crow. We don't want to hear about the Holocaust and anti-Semitism. It's so much easier to forget the ugly history of what Europeans did to the native peoples of North America. But Walter Brueggemann suggests that, that is, it is absolutely necessary to listen to this psalm. Psalm 137 gives permission and actually authorizes the powerless who have been brutalized to vent their indignation and turn to God for justice. It is an act of profound faith to entrust one's most precious hatreds to God, knowing they will be taken seriously. Let me repeat that. It is an act of profound faith to entrust one's most precious hatreds to God, knowing they will be taken seriously. In praying this way, we are not offending God by our words. Rather, we are actually trusting God to hear and to respond in God's perfect way. Not our way, not the expedient way, not the way we planned, not in the time we demand, but in God's perfect way and perfect timing. We do so knowing God promises to hear and to act. And so that is finally where we must direct our prayers. John Calvin claims that the Psalms provide an anatomy of all the parts of the soul. They are our voice praying the prayers of praise, penitence, hope, lamentation, loss, faith, fear, and rage. The Psalms give us permission, permission to grieve, permission to wail, and permission to, yes, even permission to curse when we are suffering. And though we may not have been ripped from our land and brought into captivity, many are still suffering from the results of exactly that very thing happening. Though we are not in a strange land, this time and this place that we are living in can feel like a strange land, a land full of mass strangers, a land where we fear being with one another, a land where we cannot gather in our beautiful sanctuary and worship together, a land calling out for justice long withheld, a land in much need for healing both physically, emotionally, and socially a land where no end is in sight, where there is so much work to be done, and we are tired. And so we want to sit by the river and weep. We want to hang our instruments on the willows. We ask ourselves, how can we sing our songs in this strange place? And literally, right now, we cannot. We cannot sing our, sing our songs together, that is, but we can and do still sing, not in spite of our lament, but because of our lament. Our Vacation Bible School scripture reminds us that God can do more than we can hope for or imagine. And so yes, with God we can sing in a strange land and we must sing in a strange land. Maybe not songs of joy, but songs just the same. I was reminded by a comment from Eric in a conversation with Kathleen Elder, who read the scripture so beautifully today, of the song Rivers of Babylon, originally sung by the Jamaican band The Melodians, but you may remember it sung by Bob Marley. If you haven't heard it, Google it. As Eric says, the lyrics are taken only from the first half of the psalm, which didn't surprise me. I couldn't imagine Bob Marley singing about dashing babies on rocks and Eric concluded his email with a very sad, smiley face. Robert Brimlow, a white man from Brooklyn who loved this music, in his reflections on Psalm 137 said, I loved that song even before I knew what it meant, even before I knew I couldn't get it entirely. What I did not realize then and what I can only dimly grasp now is how the song is a capturing of the African experience, 
a view of African life in the West through the lens of Israel. Never mind that King Alpha refers to the Emperor Haile Selassie and the curious theology of the Rastafarians. The song encapsulates what some theologians have urged us in the Christian community to do. Rather than interpret scripture and apply it to our lives here and now, we need to interpret the here and now and apply it to scripture. The story of the Babylonian captivity of Israel, their longing for Jerusalem and their experience of being aliens in a strange land is the story of the African slave. Even if we have not experienced what it is to be slave and tormented by political powers, the psalmist's voice does capture the sense of desolation and abandonment, a feeling a stranger, even within our own skin. And that, I think, many of us have felt at least on one occasion, that many of us may be feeling right now. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. When the wicked carried us away in captivity, required from us a song, now how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? So now I ask you, what songs are we singing? What songs are we praying? What are we remembering? But more important, what are we hoping for? What and who are we trusting in? Like the children learned this week, venturing into a new strange land requires faith and boldness and kindness and thankfulness and hope and yes, maybe even some cursing. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our Minute for Justice this week is letting you know that this Friday, July 17th, from 7 to 9 p.m., the Justice and Peace Ministry Team is hosting a second online racial justice conversation. This one will focus on what individuals who are white bring to the table without realizing it. White fragility, implicit bias, and a tendency to commit microaggressions toward people of color. We will have a guest facilitator for this session who is skilled on this topic. Please join us on Friday for a helpful and productive session. The Zoom link will be listed in the weekly church email. People of color are welcome because you have much to add to the conversation from a different perspective. At this time in our worship, it is my honor to share a moment in what we offer as the prayers of the people. God, we will continue to trust in your steadfast love and our hearts shall rejoice in your salvation. With grateful praise, we will sing to you because you, O oh God, have dealt bountifully with us, your people. I, along with your people, Pray that you, God our Savior, of our Savior Jesus Christ, may give your people the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. On behalf of all of our brothers and sisters in the world, we pray that you, our magnificent creator, would enlighten the eyes of our understanding in order that we may know the hope of your calling, the depth of your glory, and what is the exceeding greatness of your power. Gracious God of our universe, we pray for strength and endurance as we experience another week of social distancing, virtual gatherings, and anticipation for science's production of a vaccine. May those who trust in you and your will continue their work and their witness to build relationships and to practice peaceful participation that will fulfill racial justice and equity, that will reconcile right relationships with members of our LGBTQ plus communities, that redeems our nation's systemic misuse and exclusion of the poor, 
Everlasting God, may your mighty power that is at work in your son, Jesus Christ, be present in the world, in the work and witness of your people of United Christian Parish for the progression of your promises of hope and healing for the entire world. It is in the name of our Savior we pray. Amen. Go. Go knowing that there is nothing you cannot take to God. Go knowing there is nothing that God cannot do. And go knowing that this God of the Israelites, the God of the African slave, the God of us today is there with us as we weep weeping with us, weeping for us, and moving us into hope. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord, and may the peace of Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon you now and forevermore. Amen.